Judges tonight, chapter number 4. Judges chapter number 4. I feel like I should uh, <clears throat> give a, a little warning before we begin tonight in the message that uh, it's probably not going to be very politically correct. And I probably lost at least three seconds of sleep over that. Not really, but we're going to be talking about the story of uh, Deborah and Barak starting tonight. And uh, we'll be looking at it tonight and, and uh, Lord willing, uh, next week as well. And uh, I'm going to say some things that I know are probably not very popular in our culture today. Um, and even in Christian circles, no longer very popular, but, but that's okay because... It's biblical truth, and uh, biblical truth needs to be stated regardless of whether it's popular. In fact, I think it needs to be stated even more when it's not popular. But I want to begin tonight by reading verses 1 through 10, Judges chapter 4, beginning in verse number 1. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, when Ehud was dead, and the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, which dwelt in Harasheth of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had nine hundred chariots of iron, and twenty years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. And she sent and called Barak the son of Ab Ab Abinoam out of Kadesh Naphtali and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun? And I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon, Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go, but if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor, for the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman." And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh. And we, he went up with 10,000 men at his feet. And Deborah went up with him. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would instruct us from your word tonight. And Lord, I pray that we would be encouraged in our faith tonight. That it would stand in you and in your word alone. And we would not depend on others. And we would not depend on the word of man. But Lord, that we would be faithful to follow you and to obey, no matter if we have to stand alone to do it. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Many of you are probably familiar with the story of, of Deborah. And it is her name, most of all, that is recognized as, as being significant in this story. Um, and that, as we'll see tonight, was because the man in the story, a fellow by the name of Barak, um, decided that he was not going to do what God wanted him to do unless Deborah came with him. But many people mistakenly think that Deborah was the lady who drove the nail through the guy's head uh, and uh, nailed him to the ground. It actually wasn't Deborah. Uh, it was another lady by the name of Jael. And you can remember it this way. Jael drove the nail. All right. And we'll, Lord willing, look at that next week. Now, as we are studying through the book of Judges, just to remind you, it's been several weeks since we last looked in Judges chapter 3. Remember Shamgar and his ox goad? Uh, but uh, the book of Judges records a period of history, about 400 years, in which Israel was just in this vicious, downward spiritual cycle. 
they would rebel from God and they would worship idols. And as a result, God would punish them. God would chastise them by allowing foreigners to come invade them and, and oppress them. After a period of time, they would repent and cry unto the Lord and God would raise up a judge, a deliverer. And the judge was not only a military leader, but also a civil and a, a political leader. They were kind of a combination, if you will, of a lot of things, but they were, uh, they were the ones that were leading the Israelites. And for most of the time that those judges were around, Israel would, would straighten up and do right, but then the judge would pass away and they would repeat the cycle over and over again. And as you go through the book, you find that every time they go through the cycle, it gets a little bit worse and a little bit worse, and a little bit worse. Now, as, as we study through the book, there's a good bit of it that is honestly kind of depressing. When you read the stories of the judges, and you read, especially later on, some of the awful things they did, you kind of get this impression, this sense of, really, is that the best you can do? Is that the best Israel had to offer? And the answer is, yeah, that, that was the best they had to offer. And it highlights to us the depravity of man, but also how that we need a better judge, a better deliverer, a better savior. Better than even the best we could offer. We need someone better. And of course, that someone is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we come to the story of Deborah and Barak. They are fourth in, uh, in the list, in the line of judges that are mentioned in the book of Judges. And we find in verse number one, if you're keeping an outline, this is the first point, the sin of Israel. The sin of Israel. It says that the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. Now, who was Ehud? What was he famous for? He was left-handed, and he had that 18-inch dagger that he drove in the belly of King Eglon. All right, so that's that Ehud. After he died, um, the, the children of Israel went back to their evil ways, worshiping idols, they had turned from God, and were living in disobedience. Now, if you notice here, it says in verse number 3 that the Israelites were oppressed by the Canaanites for a total of 20 years. Now, I want to point that out before we talk about uh, who was oppressing them, because as, you, as we look in the book here, we see that this, this cycle is getting worse and worse and worse. You had Othniel, who, after eight years of oppression, the Israelites cried unto the Lord, and the Lord delivered them. Then we had Ehud, who, after 18 years of oppression, 10 years longer, the Israelites finally cried unto the Lord, and the Lord delivered them. Now, we have the story of Deborah and Barak here, and it has been 20 years that they have been under the oppression of the Canaanites. So we've gone from 8 years to 18 years, and now it has taken 20 years for God to get Israel's attention. That means that there were 20-year-old uh, young men and young women in Israel who grew up, all they ever knew was the oppression of the Canaanites. All they ever knew was the idol worship and the iniquity and all of the unrighteousness that Israel was guilty of. When you think about this, this is not, you know, we, because we read through these stories so quickly, it seems like, well, you know, maybe they just turned away for a short period of time. No, we're talking about an entire generation has now grown up into adulthood, and all they've known is the wickedness of, of, uh, of the heathen nations around them infecting their country, the country of Israel. Now, number two, we see the scourge of Israel in verses two and three. It says that the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan. And he reigned in a place called Hazor. So this was the name of the, the actual king of the Canaanites that uh, was, uh, uh, um, was the, the one who was leading this oppression. But then we're also introduced to a guy in verse number 2 by the name of Sisera, who was the captain of his host. He was the general of his army. Now, Sisera is going to play the major role in this story, uh, but he was, he was the, the king's, um, his, uh, his bully, if you will. It was his, his right-hand man who was in charge of enforcing the, uh, uh, the rules and the oppression of the Canaanites. Sisera dwelt in this place called Harasheth, and it tells us in verse number 3 that the Israelites cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron... Now that's significant. 
I know in our modern times, we don't use chariots a lot in modern warfare. So let's try to put this into something we would understand today. Roughly a modern equivalent would be a tank. You know, tanks are pretty formidable weapon. Um, if, if you were to see a tank roll up into our church parking lot today, you'd, you'd probably have questions. <laughs> probably, what is this about? Uh, and uh, in battlefields today, tanks are still used, and, and they're some of the most formidable ground weapons that, uh, that we have, ground vehicles that we have. And this, this, this guy, Sisera, and his army had 900 of these things. Now, we don't know exactly how many total were in the army. I mean, we could guess. There's a couple instances in uh, King David's reign uh, that uh, he fought against armies that had iron tanks. In one instance, the tank to personnel ratio was 1 to 20. So if that were true here, uh, then he would have about 18,000 soldiers. In another instance, it was closer to 1 to 35. Uh, so it could have been uh, more like 35,000 soldiers. But it's safe to say that it was over 10,000 soldiers that would have been a part of this army that also included 900 tanks, chariots of iron, if you, uh, as it says here. So this is what, this is what they're dealing with. I mean, they're not just talking about, hey, these are bad neighbors, they're making our life a little bit difficult. No, they were under very heavy oppression. Now, just to, again, kind of uh, put an exclamation point on this, look back in chapter number 1 of Judges. Judges chapter 1 and verse number 19 it says, And the Lord was with Judah, and he drave out the inhabitants of the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley, because they had chariots of iron. So having these chariots of iron was a very significant advantage. And that's what Sisera had in his army. Sisera was the scourge of Israel. He was the one that was making life difficult for them. Now in verses 4 and 5, we are introduced, this is point number three, to the matriarch of Israel, the matriarch of Israel, a lady by the name of Deborah. Deborah is introduced to us in verse number four as a prophetess. That is, she had the gift of prophecy given by God, the ability to foretell the future. She was married to a guy by the name of Lapidoth, and uh, she lived in a, a particular place uh, between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. And she had a, a particular location there called the Palm Tree of Deborah. And that's where Deborah would uh, sat and, and that's where people would come to her, according to verse number 5, for judgment. So when people had problems, uh, they would go up to uh, the Palm Tree of Deborah and they would bring their problems to this, this lady, Deborah. Now, over in chapter 5, in verse number 7, we read, The inhabitants of the villages ceased because they ceased in the land, and this is Deborah singing, until that I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel. Now, it's at this point in the message that I'm going to get a little politically incorrect. Now, it is strange, that it, at least it should strike us as strange, after reading all of the stories from Genesis on up, that God always was using men to lead His people. Noah, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, Joshua. We've read about Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar. All of these are men that God chose to lead people. And then all of a sudden, we read about a woman in this position. What's going on here? What, what's happening? Now, before I say anything further, let me say this very clearly, that God absolutely uses women to do remarkable things. Absolutely. The Bible is full of stories of women that God used to do remarkable things. Deborah is one of them. Jael, her counterpart, is another one that we'll learn about. We think about the stories in the Bible, like the story of Ruth, the story of Esther, the story of Sarah, the story of Hannah, the story of Abigail, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene. I mean, we could list example after example of women in the Bible that God used in incredible 
wonderful ways. Women are in every way equal to men as far as our worth before God Almighty. God created man and woman both in the image of God. We are equal as we stand before God. But God's creative design is very clear. We go back to Genesis and we find that God created the man first. And He gave the man certain responsibilities. And then He looked at the man and He said, It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. That is a suitable helper for him. And so God created woman, God created Eve, brought her to the man, and she and Adam were married, God officiating the very first marriage there, and she became Adam's helper. But still God's creative design was in, the, in place. Adam was the leader, Eve was the helper. Now some people think that that the uh, male authority, if I could use that a phrase, and, and we'll talk about the context of that in just a minute, but some people think that male authority is the result of the fall. It's not. It just got a lot more complicated because of the fall. God told Eve that instead of now serving alongside your man and being his helper, whereas it was before an easy and enjoyable thing, now it's going to be more difficult for you. You're going to have a harder time submitting to him and following him and supporting him. But, all it, but it didn't change God's creative design. God's design is clear. Men are to lead. Women are to play the supporting role. However, when men will not do their jobs, women are put in a position where they must step up into the role of a leader. In a home, sometimes in a community, sometimes in the church, Women have to step up and they have to lead because men won't. Women taking the lead where men should be in the lead is a certain sign of failure. Now, let me make sure you understood what I just said. I didn't say women leading is a failure. That's not what I said. What I said was women taking the lead where men should be leading. That's a sign of failure. Turn over to Isaiah, if you would. Isaiah chapter number 3. Isaiah chapter number 3. says, As for my people... Children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. Now when the Lord says to His people Israel in Isaiah 3, children are their oppressors and women rule over them, was He saying that as a positive thing? No. Saying this is a certain sign of failure. Now, here we read about Deborah back in Judges chapter 4. We know that she is called of God because in the context of the book of Judges, all the way back in chapter 2, God, it says that God was the one who raised up deliverers. She was gifted by the Lord to do what she needed to do. She was a prophetess. Deborah did not do anything wrong in answering God's call and doing what she had to do. If any wrong was done, it was done by the men who were unqualified to do the work that resulted perhaps in Deborah having to step up and do it. So understand what I'm saying tonight. Deborah was not doing anything wrong. But it is a very sad commentary on the spiritual state of Israel. And as we'll see from Barak in just a minute, he was, I think, exemplary of the attitude of the men of Israel at the time. 
It was a very sad commentary that there were no men who would step up and take the lead, that there were no men who were qualified to judge Israel. And so, yes, she stood up and she did what had to, had to be done. And let me say this, I am so thankful for godly women who in spite of awful circumstances of no fault of their own, found themselves in a position where they had to step up and lead when really that wasn't God's best. That wasn't God's perfect design. But yet they stood up and they did the hard things, they made the hard choices, and they led for the honor and glory of God. I'm so thankful for that. Whether we're talking about uh, a lot of times in, in families this happens. A man abdicates his role as leader of the home, and so what happens? The wife or the mom has to step up, and she has to make the hard choices. And she has to do what needs to be done to lead her children in a godly way. That is sad, and that is wrong every time that it has to happen. Not that the woman is doing wrong, but that the man did not fulfill his responsibility. Often it happens in the life of a church that the men become so spiritually lukewarm or absolutely cold that it is the women who are keeping the church alive spiritually. Now, we believe from Scripture that only men can be pastors of a local church. Only men can be deacons in a local church. That is 1 Timothy chapter 3 and many other portions of Scripture we could go to. So I'm not talking about necessarily a woman in the pulpit, which I do believe that that is absolutely wrong. A woman should not be pastoring a local church. But even in a church where there's only men in leadership and the pastor and the deacons and you could have only men Sunday school teachers and men everywhere, it doesn't mean that they're actually leading spiritually. Too often it is the women of a church who are leading spiritually, who are setting the spiritual tone, who are often the ones doing most of the work and most of the outreach. And whenever that is a case, whenever women have stepped up to lead because men would not, it is a sign of failure. And that's what's going on here. It's an absolute sign of failure on the part of the men of Israel. Now in verses 6 through 10, let's look at this, this man by the name of Barak. For our outline, it's point number four, the man of war. The man of war, Barak. In verse number 6, it says that Deborah sent and called this guy by the name of Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kadesh Naphtali. And she, so she sends a message to him from the Lord. Now, there's a certain sense here, and we can't say this definitely, but I do think it's a good possibility the way that she phrases this indicates that perhaps Barak had already received this message, maybe even directly from the Lord Himself. Because notice how she says it. Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor and take with thee 10,000 men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun? Hasn't God told you to do this? Is what it sounds like, doesn't it? Like, she's sending him the message saying, Hey, buddy, uh, didn't God tell you to do something? Now, whether that was the intent or whether this was actually the first time, it really doesn't change the outcome of the story because Barak gets this message from, from Deborah and he comes to see her. And, uh, and so he comes to see her and in verse uh, number 8, Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. Now, first of all, Let's, let's first of all talk about the winning strategy that, that was laid out here in verses 6 and 7. So she, she, she gets this message to him that God has said to get together an army of 10,000 people, verse number 7, that, that God was going to draw Sisera to the river Kishon and, uh, and all of his chariots and his multitudes, and God was going to deliver Sisera and his army into Barak's hand. That was the message here. This was a God has said this is what's going to happen kind of a message. You get an army together, you go toward the mountain, God's going to draw in Sisera and his army to this river Kishon, and God's going to deliver them into your hand. Now, I call this a winning strategy. Why? Because God's already said what he's going to do. All, all Barak had to do was get together the army and go down to the battle, and he was guaranteed victory. That's important. There is no question mark here about whether or not what, uh, they would win, what the outcome would be. It's very clear 
that they've already won if they will just obey. I will deliver them into thine hand, is what the Lord said. Again, notice that, the end of verse number 7. I will deliver him into thine hand. Now, we're going to fast forward a little bit. They do win. Sisera is killed, famously, with a splitting headache. And, but look at Judges chapter 5. This Judges chapter 5, by the way, is a song. The song of Deborah and Barak, a little duet here that they sang, praising the Lord for the victory. Verse 20, And they, they fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. The river of Kishon swept them away, that ancient river, the river Kishon. Oh, my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. How did they win? Well, they didn't win strictly through strength of arms. God fought for them. And a lot of the people that they, a lot of that army that they defeated simply drowned in the river. So they had a, he had a winning strategy here already. So your next point, this would be 4B. We've seen the winning strategy. Now let's talk about the wimpy soldier. Because I see in verse number 8, a man who's a coward. Now, one thing that boggles my mind, and I'm, I'm, I honestly am, as I'm studying through this, I'm, I'm trying to be fair, and I'm trying to be scripturally accurate. But one thing that boggles my mind is that when we go to Hebrews chapter 11, we have Samson, Gideon, Barak, and Jephthah, all men from the book of Judges, listed in Hebrews 11 as examples of faith. So I'm not... I'm trying to be fair, and I'm not saying that Barak had no faith at all, because God said he had faith. But that's not, it should not be used to excuse his glaring faults either. And a glaring fault that he had comes out in verse number 8. He said unto her, if thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. Why is this a problem? Well, at the very least, it's a problem because he's making his obedience to the Lord conditional. God said, get an army together and go. And he said, I won't do it unless you, Deborah, come with me. That's wrong. His attitude should have been, all right, if that's what God wants me to do, that's what I'm going to do. But that wasn't, that's not what he said. So at the very least, his, his attitude of conditional obedience, we can say on the face, is wrong. That's sinful. That was not the right attitude. But then you add to the fact in the context here, who's he talking to? He's talking to a mother of Israel. And what's he saying? Unless you go down with me to this Deadly battle where there will be hand-to-hand -hand combat, where there is going to be bloodshed, where there is the threat of your life if you go, unless you come with me, I'm not going to go. What else can we say about a man who refuses to do a man's work unless the woman is there with him? What else can we say but that he's a coward? Now, I, I have to ask myself the question, why did he want Deborah to go with him? Why was her presence more important to him than God's presence? Why would he want to make this noble woman endanger her life by going into battle? Did he not trust her message? Was it this, was it this idea of, well, if that's really true, if you really think God's going to deliver us, then you're going to have to come down to battle with me. Did he want someone to blame in case things went wrong? So she could be there and he could say, well, she told me to do it. Uh, did he not trust God that he was going to deliver him? What is going on here? We know that he had faith. Hebrews 11 says so. But his faith was weak because it depended on someone else to support him. 
He did what God told him to do, and God gave a great victory. But he should have been able to do that without Deborah holding his hand, as it were, that whole time. He had faith, but his faith was overcome by his fear. 2 Timothy 1.7, have, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Joshua 1.9 says, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Barak was an example of a man who did not act the part of a man. There's a verse in 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, Paul writes, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. That phrase, quit you like men, that's not something we use a lot in our modern day English. And it's translated from one word in the original. And it means literally to act bravely. Because you know, the, the image of bravery is so strongly associated with the ideal of manliness. I'm talking about God's kind of manliness. The man is supposed to be the protector. The man is supposed to be the leader. The man is supposed to be the first one to make the sacrifice for the good of others. That's the role of the man. It was exemplified in the Lord Jesus Christ. He came and not only was He God, not only was He human, but He was a man. He was a male human. Have you ever thought about that? Both man and woman are made in the image of God, but when God took human form, He took the form of a male, a man. Now, it's awful quiet in here tonight. <laughs> Y'all saying, I'm not sure what we're supposed to think about all this. Jesus demonstrated what perfect manliness looked like. Leading with authority, leading with humility, and being willing to sacrifice His very life for the ones that He led. For Barak to say, I'm not going to that battle unless you come with me, Deborah, showed a fear that was greater than his faith. He didn't act the part of a man. He wasn't going forward with bravery and courage. He was dependent upon Deborah for that. And so we have finally the, the warning of shame in verses 9 and 10. The warning of shame... And she said, verse 9, back in Judges chapter 4, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thy honor. For the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh, and Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and he went up with 10,000 men at his feet, and Deborah went up with him. Notice the warning that she gave him. She said, all right, I'll go with you. But just know this, that this journey is not going to result in your honor. Barak, if you had gone and obeyed the Lord unconditionally and been willing to go out there and encourage, stand and fight against Sisera and his army, then maybe, maybe you would have gotten a little bit of honor, maybe a little bit of credit. Maybe people would have said, attaboy, Barak, but not now. No, your honor is going to be surpassed by the honor of another woman. A woman who wasn't a soldier. A woman who wasn't anyone special. She was just a woman who knew how to cook some good food and take advantage of a God-given opportunity. And they say to this day, if you were to go to Israel where these ba this battle supposedly took place, you see signs everywhere. And you know what it talks about? Who it talks about? It talks a whole lot about Deborah. You know who it doesn't say a lot about? Barak. And we're going to stop there for sake of time. 
You might be wondering, all right, what's the point, Pastor? What do we take away from this that we can use this week? Well, let me, let me first of all address, address the men of our church. Be the man that God wants you to be. Take leadership. That has to first of all start with you, yourself. Take leadership of yourself. So many men are unqualified and unfit to lead in the home, in the church, in the community, because they cannot even lead themselves. They have no self-control. Men, you have to lead yourself first. If you can't lead yourself to be self-controlled, how can you leave your wife and children? If you can't lead yourself to be faithful in your walk with the Lord, how can you lead your wife and children to do that? If you can't be faithful to get up and go to work on time and provide for your family, if you can't be faithful uh, to make sure that you keep your thought life in check and you guard what you let into your mind through your eyes and through your ears, if you can't be faithful to lead yourself, you're not fit to lead anyone else. Be a man and lead yourself first. Be a man and then, if you're married, lead your wife be the husband that God has called you to be. And let me say this to you men. You are leading in a way. The question is, how are you leading? Are you leading poorly by setting a bad example or are you leading well? Are you leading like God wants you to lead? You need to lead your wife. In your home, men, you should be the one setting the spiritual tone. Lead your children. Lead in the church, men. Step up. Be involved. Do what needs to be done. Shame on us as men if we let the, the ladies of our church do all the work. Don't let the women in your life do your job. Lead yourself. Lead your family. Lead in the church. Let me give you some practical tip, men. If you've got children in the home, you be the one that helps get them ready on Sunday morning. Don't, let your, don't make your wife do that. She's got enough on her plate. She's thinking about, you know, cooking the food and, and this, that, and other thousand different things. Don't just sit around and wait for her to get the kids ready too. Get in there and say, you know what? We got church today. It's important for us to be there and to be on time. Let's, let's get ready. Lead in that way. Lead your family in devotions, men. Something called a family altar has gone by the wayside. I used to hear a lot of preaching about that when I was growing up. The family altar, a time when a family would gather together and they would spend time in prayer and Bible reading. Men, lead your family like that. Lead your family in family devotions. Figure out a system that works for you. Everybody's going to be a little bit different. You find out something that works for you. But you lead your family. You be faithful. Lead in the church. Get involved. Don't make your wife have to poke you and prod you to do this and do that. And hey, honey, shouldn't we go here? And you know, we got this special meeting. You should be the one saying, hey, don't forget, we've got revival. Hey, don't forget, we've got visitation. Don't forget, we've got missions conference. We got whatever it is. Take charge, men. Now let me, let me have a moment with you ladies to give you some application. Be the woman that God wants you to be. You're called to lead in certain areas of your life too? Then lead, by all means. Be the leader, especially if you have children in the home. Lead your children. Support also your husband. He needs your support. Oh, does he need your support. God knew what He was talking about when He said, it's not good that a man should be alone. And any man in here that has half a brain cell <laughs> understands how true that is. Proverbs said, He that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. You say, well, you ladies might be thinking, He doesn't need me. He needs you more than you will ever understand. He needs your support. 
But what he doesn't need is another mother in his life. Okay? I'm just, I'm just being honest. You say, but he acts like a kid. I get it. Okay? I understand. But the proper way to fulfill your role is to be his wife, not his mother, not his third grade teacher, not his school principal, to be his wife, to be his support, to come alongside him. God's called him to do certain things too, and he needs you to support him and help him in doing that. Be a godly influence, ladies, to all those around you. Use whatever influence God has given you for His glory and for His honor. And let me say to you ladies in here, if you are ever called to take the place of a man in a position of leadership because he abdicated his responsibility, let me encourage you that God's grace is sufficient. Rely on Him and He will see you through. And then last, let me make an application for everybody tonight. And it's this. Don't let your faith depend on someone else. That was Barak's problem. If you go with me, I'll go. If you don't, I won't. His faith and his obedience depended on Deborah. Don't be that way. If God calls you to do something... He will go with you and He will give you the ability to do it. And that is enough. It should have been enough for Barak that it had already been told him, God is going to deliver them. But it wasn't enough for him. And so he had to drag Deborah along. Don't be like that. While it is a blessing to have dependable helpers, you should not determine whether you obey God based on who will help you do it. You should determine, I'm going to obey God. I'm going to trust God regardless of who goes with me. I will follow God. I will have faith even if it means going alone. The heads bowed and eyes closed this evening. I'm thankful that most of us, for most of our life, don't have to go through life alone. You know, we go through seasons occasionally where we feel especially alone. Sometimes those are long seasons and sometimes there are some very extenuating circumstances. But I'm thankful that most of the time we have people around us that are help, a help to us, an encouragement to us. And that is a blessing. But at no time should our faith in God and our obedience to Him be dependent on someone else. There's some of you that if your spouse wasn't going to church, you wouldn't go to church. If your spouse didn't live a Christian life, you wouldn't live a Christian life. If your parents weren't following the Lord, you wouldn't follow the Lord. If your friends weren't following God, you wouldn't follow God. There's some of you that your obedience and your faith are dependent on others. And tonight you need to confess. You need to confess that you have put someone else in the place of God. And you need to put God back on the throne of your life. In just a moment, my wife's going to play the old invitation hymn, I have decided to follow Jesus. And if God has spoken to your heart tonight about following Him and having faith regardless of who goes with you, then you take the time right now and go to the Lord in prayer. Confess your sin. Ask God for the grace to be faithful to Him regardless of who is with you.